in fact, men, when they hear the sorts of things I'm talking about, they become defensive because mm-hmm. they think, you're asking me to give up my power. Is that what you're asking me to do? They see it as a zero-sum game, right? Yeah. If women get more power, that means by definition we get less power. And that's how they see this. Hey, everyone. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I am your host, Gwendolyn Dalski, And today, this is an interview with Dr. Tom Keith. He is a filmmaker. He is a writer. He is a philosophy professor. And we're going to be talking about toxic masculinity. His book is Masculinities in Contemporary American Culture. And his latest documentary is called Bullied. If you have any questions about this episode, do feel free to get in touch because Tom will be on the show again in the late spring or early summer. So he'll be able to answer your questions. And you can tweet me at gdalski or at in the details pod. Here's the interview. One of the things that you're going to be talking about is toxic masculinity. And I thought I would give our listeners just a brief background. Somebody I'm very much interested in is the philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft from the late 1700s. And for our listeners, you may not have heard of her, but you definitely know who her daughter is, Mary Shelley, the beginning of sci-fi. And did you know that Mary Shelley wrote that in part about gender construction based on the work of her mom? Yeah. You know, her, her mom died giving birth to her, so she never knew her mother and went back and was reading all these amazing things that she was writing. And Frankenstein was sort of this, you know, construction of human beings, but construction of how we become who we are. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I read Frankenstein in high school, like most people, and then I was reading uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, and I reread Mary Shelley in light of that, and it was really interesting. It is. But we've got Mary Wollstonecraft from the late 1700s. So keep in mind, uh, women don't even have the vote for well over a century later. Just a bit of a background. She's writing about women being educated and women should be educated. And this is in the same time frame, just to put it in a historical context, of the American Revolution, the French Revolution. So it makes sense where people are talking about wanting to govern themselves. And in this work where Mary Wollstonecraft is talking about women should have the capacity to reason, she anticipated a pushback about marriage. And she was anticipating this idea that, oh, if women are educated, then that would destroy marriage. And she responded to that by saying that it would strengthen marriage because marriage would be based on friendship. That to actually have that Mm. radical asymmetry Mm. was more problematic because women would just be trained to be pretty and get a man. And then once they get married, that's their training is over, they're done. They've accomplished their life goal. And that um, it's actually much better. So what I think is interesting is from as far back as the 1700s, you have this discussion about women and gender and understanding an impact it would have on relationships. Mm -hmm. And Tom, your work is dealing with our understanding of how men are raised and what are some assumptions about their nature and how that impacts relationships. So could you tell us a bit about what is toxic masculinity? And I would agree with Simone de Beauvoir that our gender is constructed, that there's nothing natural about any of this, that we are trained usually from early childhood that we're to follow certain templates of what it is to be a boy, a girl. In fact, when you ask boys today, what does it mean to be a boy? They always speak in the negative, not feminine, not they, they are that polar opposite they're being taught. The toxic masculinity is sort of uh, an old fashioned, a traditional way of looking at masculinity, that men should be in charge, that men should have authority, that women should not, so that women should have, that men should have power and women should, you know, stay at home and, and raise children. And it's very traditional, but it becomes toxic because it, it becomes violent in a lot of cases. And the violence isn't just aimed at women, it's aimed at other men as well. And so how to become men who are not violent who can have relationships, as you were saying before, that are more egalitarian. So mm-hmm. there's so more of a partnership rather than a parent-child relationship of the past. Yeah. The founders of this nation, Jefferson was a misogynist and, and said to his own daughters in one letter that when you get married, you shall serve him as a master the way you serve me as a master. So mm-hmm. this whole legacy of, of men are in charge and, and women need to know their place. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir said 
Why is it that we're told when we're little girls that the most important day is going to be our wedding day? It's sort of like it's all downhill from there, I guess, right? So your whole reason for being is to find a man, get a man, have children, and then go through the lot of life uh, where men are not told that narrative, of course. Men are taught you have careers and you're to build wealth and equity and power. Yeah. Um, so all of that's being disrupted. I mean, there was a time when uh, if you'd ask men, how do you justify this? Uh, the British philosopher Mill stated this is just akin to slavery. When you um, subordinate one group, Over time, of course, they're going to feel, they're going to internalize their subordination and begin to behave like that. And so back in those days, if you would ask these men, how do you justify behaving like this toward women? Well, you know, look at at who are the great scientists. Look who the great artists and literary, they were all men. Well, that was for the de facto reason because women weren't allowed. They didn't have the opportunities or access. And so here we are a hundred and some odd years. It wasn't, by the way, till 1979 that Columbia University in New York City allowed women. So this is still, the legacy isn't as old as you think it is. Uh, And how are we doing now? Well, now women are in STEM they're doing amazing work. Uh, the the, the head most of... amount just elected to Congress. I'm just going to throw out there that Mill, the philosopher he's referring to, wrote this piece about women. I think it was in the 1860s. Yeah, right around there. 1860s. The and so of women. that's 100 years after Wollstonecraft. Mm-hmm. And then that is 100 years later, you've got Columbia University. Yeah, so Mill is writing about this. Is it true that his wife helped him write that? Yes. Really? Yeah, they wrote oh, okay. it together. I didn't know if that was a rumor. Yes. Oh, okay. They she wrote was a philosopher in, a, in her own right. If you really want to hear a tender little story about Mill, because he was a member of parliament and no, known for his inductive logic, and you wouldn't think anything tender, but she died before he did. Mm-hmm. And she was buried, I guess, in her hometown, which was, I don't know, 40, 50 uh, miles from London. And so he moved. So he could be near her every single day and go down and visit her at the grave. He had this, Aww. they had this really, but he called her his partner, that they were working partners, that she also was a philosopher in her own right, but certainly didn't get the, the this sort of uh, visibility that he did. In that piece, he also addresses this nature argument that we hear to this day, this idea that women are naturally you know, this way and men are naturally that way. And so in the 1860s, he's addressing it by saying, you can't prove that because we have only known each other in relation to each other. So scientifically, in order to know the nature of something, you'd have to isolate it. The philosopher at SUNY uh, City University of Newark, Jesse Prinz, if you know his work, he's talked about this, that it was the agricultural era where men really began to dominate because now women didn't have uh, the legal right to ownership of property. And so they owned the farms, they cultivated the farms, and then capital made them wealthy. The women had no capital, no bank accounts, nothing. And that's where the real split in economic disparity began. If you go back far enough, anthropologists say that that According to them, families uh, were part of tribal groups and that more egalitarian then and that this sort of, you know, male hierarchy, this dominance was later. I think that today, because when it comes to careers or getting ahead, physical strength is no longer a requirement. What's happening is that people still want to hold on to this idea of dominance that has to do with the physical when that's not really relevant. I know something I'd like to ask. And I don't have an answer for it, so I'm wondering what you think. One of the things that bothers me is how, let's say, when I read someone like Wollstonecraft or I read Mm. someone like Beauvoir, and it makes sense to me, and I'm in a profession that's a male-dominated profession. It is. So how does this idea have staying power? What do you think? Because it seems so illogical to me to say that one sex is superior to the other, and whatnot, or some of these old ideas about nature, how does it have staying power for hundreds of years? It's the same question you'd ask of white people. Why do white people have thousands of years of of supremacy? You know, part of it was economic power, Mm -hmm. enslaving a certain group. I mean, Mill, as you know from that article, compares the subjection of women to slavery. Mm -hmm. And that even when you release slaves and they're emancipated now, it's not – you don't have equality, of course. It takes hundreds and hundreds of years and lots of effort to get to some kind of equality. And we're still not there. Mm -hmm. So when you think about racial 
equality, that, and it's the same thing. Men have been in charge for a very long time. Women have come a long way. There's still a very long way to go. But I think the real answer is those with power want to keep their power. It's that simple. Yeah. They don't want to release that power. They, In fact, men, when they hear the sorts of things I'm talking about, they become defensive because mm-hmm. they think, you're asking me to give up my power. Is that what you're asking me to do? They see it as a zero-sum game, right? Yeah. If women get more power, that means by definition we get less power. And that's how they see this. There was an article that was called uh, The War on Men. It was by written by a woman. Yeah. You know her. Yeah. Susan, is it Venkir? Venker? Is that how you pronounce her name? Uh, I thought that was uh, Suzanne Christina Venker. Hoffman, but okay. No, oh, yeah, she wrote something else. Yeah. Uh, I, I know what you're thinking of. Yeah. Um, but in the same vein, there was this article on the war on men, and she is explaining to women why men no longer want to get married. It's because women aren't women anymore. Okay, so I have a quote, though, that women wanting to get careers, that what they're doing is they are trying to take away from men when women have their own pedestals. But she wraps up her article with the following quote, that there's a solution to the problem. Women have the power to turn everything around. All they have to do is surrender to their nature, their femininity, and let men surrender to theirs. Well, I, I, if she were here, I'd say, no, now explain what you're talking about because it, it's a riddle, right? Yeah. It's saying that men are of a certain nature from from Darwin or God or whatever and, and women have a different and opposite nature. Mm-hmm. Says who? You know, I mean, you can say those things, but what's her evidence of this? And she's going to point to the past. I would remind her that the past is full of uh, of keeping women out of opportunities, of making sure that women didn't have the opportunities. All of this is socially constructed, in my opinion. I, I think de Beauvoir is right about this. And so these people want to get us back into the sa- – back into the dark ages when they thought this was all just a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Notice, I I use the comparison to white supremacy because I see it very clearly. That's what white people have been saying forever, that Mm -hmm. these other races were inferior by nature, Mm -hmm. right? This this great being, this arc of being or whatever they called it. And the Klan itself, the Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization that claims that this is how God made everything. So when I hear these really backwards arguments, my challenge would be show me the evidence what if would you say to people who talk about let's say well there's testosterone and that's part of the evidence well there's no doubt we have 20 times more free-floating uh serum t in our blood than women do but but what's the art what is their argument that that yeah. makes us what smarter that, that makes us yeah. uh i mean it what we know it is has something to do with competition. There have been over a dozen studies since 1950s, I mean, major longitudinal studies on testosterone. None of them have been able to correlate it to antisocial behavior, to aggression or violence. So all of this, there's something innate about men that makes them more, although we do, by the way, perpetrate far more violence worldwide than do women. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to find something biological. They thought it was the warrior gene, the MAOA gene. Then it was testosterone, of course. Maybe it's two Y chromosomes in some men. Mm -hmm. All of these, you know, and none of it has panned out. Now, maybe they'll find something eventually, but so far, biology just has not shown us anything. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, this is back to Wollstonecraft, a line that she said that still haunts me is this idea that there was a real consequence to just training women to be obedient and to be pretty and that the consequence was they'd become more useless members of society and the reason why that haunts me is because then it's you know when you read about things like gender side or you know just women baby girls just being discarded or that there's not a value um, if there's that idea and so what I want to ask you is that in that context of that there is a real consequence to holding on to this artificial idea of gender and that role. That is what she was saying for women. What is the consequence for men? Yeah, I I mean, one of the things that we're taught from boyhood is to be emotionally stoic. Other than anger, we we have permission to to lash out and act Mm -hmm. angry. But we're told, you know, we can't show weakness. And weakness is interpreted as feminine. So that would be things like fear. Uh, loneliness, sadness. You never show any of those things. Here's the number one consequence. Uh, Nationwide, men commit suicide four times more than women. Mm 
mm-hmm. and it depends on the regions. It's even higher in other regions. We don't go to the doctor. You know how hard it is just to get men to go to the doctor and have a, a physical checkup? My own doctor told me that he has uh, more than half of his male patients refuse to have the digital exam for, for prostate cancer. So it's, it's all of this that we've bound up that, that we think somehow – we have some kind of uh, superiority of, of muscularity and physical strength, but it's really quite weak when you think about everything else. The gender construction of males has been anything but strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we're the ones that create wars, but we're killing each other. Uh, women don't create wars. They weren't in a position to do so. But, you know, I think that the, it's an artificial notion that men somehow have greater power, somehow greater strength. Mm-hmm. Other than, you know, upper body strength, there's something that was part of, you know, probably our ancestral pasts. But other than that, emotional strength, we, d- we really don't have it. This is um, not something that you worked on, let's say, with your when you were working on your graduate studies, your dissertation. So what know. drew you to this idea of toxic masculinity and Excuse me. And these projects like The Bro Code, right. your film. Oh, it was the cutest route. I mean, you know, from going to grad school and philosophy. The um, cutest route, is that what you said? It's a circuitous <laughs> route, you know. It, oh, circuitous. circuitous. Okay. <laughs> you, I thought you said the cutest. I was like, that's, <laughs> oh, the cutest route. that's well, adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one better. I'll use that one okay. in the future. Um, <laughs> you know, our, the graduate programs in America anyway are very British analytic in some continental, but they're very rigid, you know, here's Mm -hmm. where you go and everyone wants to be, they call it cognitive science now, but philosophy of mind or whatever. And so, you know, I was introduced to the American pragmatists in grad school and that changed my thinking. Suddenly people like William James and John Dewey were talking about what is philosophy actually doing Mm -hmm. to change the world? We're in an ivory tower talking about things that almost nobody knows about, nobody cares about, and has zero impact on the world. So is philosophy just going to be the the thought museum curators of, of old white dead men? Is that what our job is? Or are we going to somehow get our hands – this is – William James said, get our hands dirty in facts Mm -hmm. and actually get involved. And that just changed everything for me. Then to the bro code. So here I am teaching classes and writing my my stupid little articles that go into peer evals, you know, and and if you've done it, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You, You devote all this time, you submit it, it gets accepted, nobody reads it. You go to a conference, that's bullshit. And you you kind of after a while go, what am I doing? Yeah. Am I really doing what, you know, is this it? This is my life. And so I, I show a film or two sometimes in class and I met up with the work of Gene Kilborn, Jackson Katz, people like that. And I go, this is amazing. You know, I'd never even heard about anything like this. And so my first question is, is there a way to bridge what I have as a background with the things they're talking about and make it relevant, make it relevant to people's lives? Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the, the shorthand version of how I got there. I mean, since you are around a lot of uh, university campuses and such, and you've been doing this for a while, uh, there was an article that, let's see, this was in the Daily Beast. And it said, uh, Me Too is making colleges teach toxic masculinity 101. Some... <laughs> Again, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I think something that I would be interested in since you have been – so when did Generation M come up Eight. documentary? Yeah, I started – and I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never made a film in my life. Please, and I was it's lucky. very good. It's good. The students – Love it. Hmm. I'm just going to put out there well, I my can't students even watch it. it. It's just unwatchable. But um, <laughs> it's, um, it was in 2006, I decided, you know, the hell with it. I'm going to stop making these articles and uh-huh. I think I'll make a film. And so, I, of course, I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to meet a couple people, some film students at SC, and I told them what I want to do. They go, let's do it. And yeah. so we all started sitting down and, and they knew the technical side of it and all of that and slowly taught me how to do that. Now I do everything myself. Yeah, I just jumped in. I, I remember hearing that um, Tarantino was at, I want to say, SC talking to a film class. And they were, of course, oh, how do you do it? How do you get into the business, right? And I remember him saying, well, just go make a film. Go make it on your computer. Just go do it. You don't talk about it. Just, and so that was sort of my, I thought, okay, fine. I'll, yeah. I'll do that. I threw it that together. As I said, I really mean it when I say it's unwatchable. I can't even look at it today. It's so <laughs> technically, it's like like some little kids made it or something. But I did get to meet people like Katz and Gene and and then a whole bunch of other wonderful people. The best thing about filmmaking is I've met now hundreds of people I would never have met otherwise that yeah. have just enriched my life. 
Well, since you are, this is partly a tool for your students, and now it's being, you know, you're talking about it at universities all over. And since Generation M came out, you said 2008, or that's when Mm -hmm. you worked on it. So in the last 10 years, what kinds of things have you noticed about the discussion in 10 years with young people Mm -hmm. about, let's see, toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. and the way they're relating on campus, and then even with the Me Too movement? What's a shift in the last decade? It's shifting. There's no doubt about it. Young people, and I speak in red states too, the young people all around this country are much more gender conscious. They're also much more LGBT conscious as well. Mm -hmm. So something, in in fact, when I started teaching, because my first year of teaching was 1995. That's how long I've been doing it. And I brought in same-sex marriage as like like a topic for discussion. Mm -hmm. Southern California now, every student was against it. Really? Every student. It was a crazy idea that I would even bring it up in the classroom. That's how it was sent back to me in 1995. And I've been teaching long enough to watch this incredible seismic shift in the thinking of young people when it comes to sexuality. And gender and sexuality are already always sort of discussed together. Uh-huh. So I've watched this shift, and not just with women, but with young men too. Uh, something is going on. Young men are much more conscious of their gender performances as their role of men, how they interact with women. Mm-hmm. Something's happening that's very progressive. So I'm optimistic because I talk to young people who already are parents and mm-hmm. they're parenting differently. They, they don't, they're not traditional. They're not the way their parents were. Yeah. Men so, have diaper bags. <laughs> <laughs> There's diaper bags for men. Yeah. I, I mean, they're more hands-on. Young dads are more hands-on with their kids. They're not ashamed to be emotional with their children. Yeah. And daughters are encouraged to to go to school and get good grades and all of that. That's just sort of, I think the dichotomy is really broken down. The traditional dichotomy is broken down. And um, and that's, again, I'm, I'm fairly encouraged for the future. Mm-hmm. Young people really impress me that they're kind of living a more progressive life and not just talking it. Yeah. I am um, also interested in some of the things that you've said about when you've traveled, what has been some of the the resistance or the pushback to your approach or discussion of toxic masculinity? Because, I mean, here we're all, you know, it seems to make sense. What happens when it doesn't make sense to somebody? And, you know, I'm going to go to the work of C.J. Pascoe, first of all, because she, after I had several of these episodes in very large auditoriums, C.J.'s worked on um, masculinity in groups, and she says uh, men in groups act differently than they do one-on-one. When I go to universities, they'll have me do sometimes some frat-only events, and I should just bring a camera in there and document the things that they say and do. It's mm-hmm. like everyone has to outdo each other. Who can be, who can say the crazier thing? Who can say really uh, politically correct doesn't even begin to, you know. So it's sort of like, but you get them one-on-one, and they're completely different. Mm-hmm. So the pushback I get is a lot of times in those contexts where men are trying to be funny. They're trying to get cool points with their bros, you know, and yeah. so they're saying ridiculous things. But once in a while, it will be someone. I, I remember one time I was talking about uh, Grand Theft Auto, the Rockstar games, and we went gorilla in New York and went into the Rockstar studios with our cameras going because they he wouldn't interview with me. So I said, oh, the hell with it. We'll just go up there and film him. And I asked him, why do you have as a gamer option that you can rape and murder women, you know, and get away with that. And you get extra points actually for that. Well, it's just a fantasy, you know. And so I was talking about that one time and this guy just goes absolutely nuts on me and just says, dude, you know, you don't even understand the game. I go, well, then why don't you explain it to me? He goes, it's just a fantasy, dude. You know, it's just you, you, and they're prostitutes anyway. You know, you really can't rape Mm. prostitutes. Wow. And so in the whole place, when when moments like that happen, everyone kind of groans, you know, because everyone's going, oh, God. And then it's my turn to say, let me try to explain why I think they just groaned on you. Because, of course, you can rape prostitutes and murder prostitutes. That's a human being. You're trying to strip them of their humanity when you say something like that. And... And even though he said, well, it, it's just a fantasy in a game, I pushed him on that because, you know, in Generation M, what I did, mm-hmm. and I put Rockstar Games right on there because the president of that company and I had a real tense moment together. And, and so I said, if that's a fantasy, why is it a fantasy? Because you wouldn't be playing a game where you could molest children. Yeah. You wouldn't play a game where you could lynch black people. 
You mm-hmm. wouldn't do that because that fantasy would make you either what? A pedophile or a racist? Mm-hmm. So if it's just fantasy but an enjoyable fantasy to rape and murder women, what does that make you? And I've never heard every time I've answered that, asked that question a good answer yet. I'm still waiting. It's an effective question because this idea we there's – we get away with misogyny. That's still an okay thing to do. That's still something that uh, I think seems to be forgivable. Um, I, I mean, I don't mean that that's okay. I mean mm-hmm. that somebody no. can be a misogynist, mm-hmm. and that's not a count against them. As opposed no, you to, you can be say, president of the United States, as, uh, mm-hmm, as <laughs> opposed to being racist. Yeah, we don't necessarily treat race the way we treat gender in this country. Mm -hmm. If someone were to slip, I mean, look at Michael Richards, the comedian from Seinfeld. He blurts out the N-word at a comedy club. He's done. His career's over. Whereas you still have artists that blurt out the B-word and C-word on their careers are full swing. So, yeah. you know, Eminem's a guy that says, I won't use the N-word in my rhymes out of respect for the black community. And I know the power of words to hurt and harm. And then he uses the B-word and the C-word and everything else. And yeah. his career hasn't suffered much of a hit at all. So Women defend him. Some women will defend him even. So you're right. There is a, yeah. There's a double standard in our, in our culture about race and gender. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I know for me, and I was a big fan of Seinfeld, but I can't look at him the same. I I, I can't. It's because of that. Mm-hmm. And then I feel the same way. And I think a lot of people felt the same way about when uh, Mel Gibson went on his anti-Semitic rant. I mean, his career definitely plummeted mm-hmm. as a result. And, you know, this whole idea that he was just drunk and that's why he did it. I mean, no one was buying it. You could give me all of the vodka in Poland, and I will not do it. <laughs> I'll probably start talking about a uh, Descartes or something, but I don't know. But if you are, you know, making uh, sexist jokes or whatnot, that doesn't do anything to your career. I try to use that as sort of a wedge with young men sometimes. I'll say, you know, a lot of you probably, I don't have to convince you that racism is a bad thing. I don't have to convince you not to use the N word or something. A lot of young men, I say, but. A lot of you are probably using the B word on a daily basis, you know, Mm -hmm. or other slurs toward women. And if one's discrimination, isn't the other discrimination too? How can you, you know, how can you hold both of those? This one's a bad one, but this one's an acceptable one. I Mm -hmm. mean, where are those rules coming from? And if they're both bad, why don't you eliminate both of them from your lives? And this is something that would be disruptive to to a relationship. And this is probably where some ideas of violence come about. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. I, I think the violence starts with especially men who feel that they are in power, that they should be in power, that they have the authority over women. And if you're in a relationship with a man like that, all it takes is for you to disagree with him, and it could be on anything, mm-hmm. and he's going to get angry very, very quickly, and that could escalate into an episode of violence. When I've asked interviewees, because I, I know how I'd answer, but I always like to hear what other people would say, what are men getting out of being more egalitarian? Right. And many interviewees would say the same thing. They had the opportunity of having better, more intimate and connected relationships with women. Yeah. You know, you get a real authentic partner instead of some kind of um, this this parent child again uh, relationship, which that's not your friend. That's someone that you can bully around. That's tell them what to do. And that's not someone you could really be intimate with um, emotionally and, and, and in any other way. So. I think that's what's missing in a lot of men's lives. And when you talk to young men, they want relationships. They want good relationships Mm -hmm. with someone they love and respect. They want all that. And I don't think they necessarily know how to do it because they still think the bad boy is getting all the attention from women. That's what they think. And when you talk to women, they say, no, that's not true. So... I think that's part of what I do is to bridge that gap and to say, you know, man, I don't think you have to put on this act, what what Jackson Katz calls the tough guys, G-U-I-S-E, to try to impress your bros and that you think that now women are going to take you as a credible dating partner or however you're filtering that. Um, I think if you just be yourself and let that come through, you, a lot of people are going to find you attractive. And isn't that going to be easier anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, you know, if you've got to go through life constantly checking yourself because oh, am I you know, acting the right way, who can live like that? If you can be yourself, you're, the people around you are going to care about you for who you are instead of some act that you're putting on. 
Something that, and I don't know if you if you caught this too, but that the Jackson Cats talked about was the bystander syndrome. Mm-hmm. And I was just mm-hmm. wondering what your thoughts were on that, because let's think about a solution. We've identified a problem. What are some of the ways to talk about this? This is, this is a place where I think Jackson Cats nails it. Uh-huh. I think he's one of the most astute gender scholars of our time and and talks about bystanderism as knowing things are going on, not doing anything about it. You see yeah. this in frat life all the time. When you hear that a woman was raped or sexually assaulted in a frat house and you're going – and everyone's acting like I didn't see anything. I don't know. Well, they know. They'll have information. People talk, but they keep it to themselves. I call mm-hmm. it the bro code of silence. So this sort of bystanderism is built into male relationships. It's very – you know. From the time we're, we're little boys, we're, we're taught you never rat out your friend. You know, you never let anyone know if they did something. It's a kind of a prison mentality, too. Um, and so the bystander is that individual who, who could make a difference, mm-hmm. chooses not to. Part of that, of course, is going along to get along, right? You don't want to be the – imagine there's 20 guys here and you're the person going, you know, guys, we shouldn't do that. Now yeah. you're the target for abuse. So there's that. There's that peer pressure going on. But Jackson says the most effective sort of bystander intervention isn't what they're doing at Green Dot, where they're basically teaching people to be glorified bouncers. It's where you have credible voices near them, friends, family members, who can have a talk with them in a credible way about the way we're behaving and disrupting bad behaviors before they happen. You know, so much of the intervention, the bystander intervention is, when you see a fight, what do you do? And, you know, that's kind of after the fact. Yeah. How do we change men before they get to that moment? And and so that they'll check their friends as well in, in advance and, and friends and family, you know, co-workers. Uh, um, if you're on a sports team, you know, uh, one of your teammates, there's lots of credible voices there if they stand up and have a leadership moment and, and talk to this young man in a, in a credible way, mm-hmm. change lives. But today, I mean, I take like ex-NFL uh, player Terry Crews, who's come out and talked about being sexually assaulted himself. And other men, you know, are now coming out that would be your sort of alpha males of the past that would never talk about this stuff. And now they're starting to. So in my new film, newest film, The Empathy Gap, I, I list a bunch of men, some of them former NFL players. They're now pro-feminist. They're now saying things. I'm, I'm thinking that... Um, not Jeremy Shockey, the guy from the New Orleans Saints that came out very pro uh, LGBT and, and uh, equal rights. And this I never would have heard when I was a young man. You know, you never heard things like this. You have in the NBA, the he for she uh, model that's going on right now, Steph Curry and LeBron James speaking out for women and, and the autonomy of women and respecting women's voices. And that was just unheard of when I was a young man. So I think that logjam is starting to break up a little bit. Those male voices are going to be the attractive voices, I think. That that's the one, like, I think that there's going to be a shift. Yeah, and I hate this. I hate it. When I put them into the film, I even debated myself. I thought, you know, you're kind of playing the hegemonic game here. You know, let's put in these alpha males to show mm-hmm. that it's cool to be feminist, right? Yeah. And so I kind of had that internal war, but at the end of the day, I said, well, screw it, you know. <laughs> show that these yeah. guys... They're not threatening to a lot of men's mask sense of masculinity, right? Yeah. If anything, they're sort of the prototypes. And when you see that they're saying things that are very pro-feminist, now a lot of these other underlings or whatever you want to think of them look at them, well, that, that's a credible voice to these guys. I'm not a credible voice as much as they are. Yeah. I did a tour with Byron Hurt one time, and you know he was a uh, former NCAA quarterback. He uh, has the film Beyond Beats and Rhymes about hip-hop culture and the misogyny and the misogyny and sexism and homophobia in hip-hop culture. And I would notice something when we would talk, and Shira Tarrant was with us one time too, and she's a professor of gender studies at Long Beach State. She'd get out to speak, and I'd be looking at the audience, and um, the, most of the guys would be there just playing with their phones. They're not even paying attention when she's speaking. Then I'd get up to talk, and some of the guys would start to look. at. They'd look up a little bit, you know, they're kind of like this. Byron would get up, all eyes on him. He's six foot five, black athlete, has the whole street vibe thing going, and they were just glued now. And so when I saw that, I go, okay, okay. So I want to use and position men like that to try to break through this concern that men don't want to seem feminine in any way or to embrace feminism. I call it the other F word because it's been so... You the know, other F word, I like The that. other F word because it's it's been so stereotyped and so denigrated. And so you'll hear... 
Many more young women saying they're feminists than ever before. But men, that's still a big leap for men to say something like that. They see that as very threatening to their their masculinity and to even to their sexuality. So they'll so when I hear Terry Crews say, I'm a feminist, which is exactly what he said on the Larry King show, uh-huh. you know, I said, no, nah, that's good. That's that's movement. And well, in a cap, actually in a capitalist society that there is no it's not a matter. It, there's the possibility with a society like this that it grows. So there's not just room for one person, let's say with a business. And then if women are doing well, then they are taking from men. It just means that it grows. So it's in the int- it's in an economic interest to have as many people participating as possible. I mean, for example, I mean, just like in philosophy, like I said, it's a male dominated field. But when women come in, they start adding a lot to it or mm. you have more women physicians and then there's a lot more attention to uh, women's reproductive health and mm. things like women being educated or whatnot. And now there's plenty of women in Fox as well. So clearly on some level, they believe, you know, that equality has been a good thing. I mean, they have newscasters and, and journalists that are women. But this is part of this notion that feminism has hurt the the family the dyadic unit of the family, because now men are confused. What's our new role now? If we're not, if we're going to be you yeah. know, partners, what do we do? You know, and yeah. Well, this is something Simone de Beauvoir talked about: is that women participate in their own mm-hmm. objectification. They they turn themselves into projects, as opposed to men have projects that are out into the world. So mm-hmm. she even talks about this in terms of literature. When you read someone like Dostoevsky, he's challenging the entire concept of right and wrong and the organization of the world, as opposed to um, writers, I mean, who I adore, and I think she did like too, but Jane Austen and George Eliot, even these Mm -hmm. extremely incredible female authors, but they focus on the psychology within the home and that Mm -hmm. that was a big, that was a big difference. So, but even later on, I mean, it's, I mean, sometimes I see stuff, like I see snippets of reality TV and I just think, what the hell would Wollstonecraft say or what would Simone de Beauvoir say? I mean, where you have... These women who, you know, everybody just seems to care so much about, you know, how fancy their purse is or Have you how seen, much um, money their husband has. And it's just, it's just so like, that's what I'm wondering. How does it has staying power? It's not a matter of, oh, men do this. Women participate in it. There's two, you know, Ariel Levy's Female Chauvinist Pigs? The book from oh, 2005. Yes, yes. Yeah. She goes right into the heart of all of this, where she was challenging the girls gone wild uh, ethos about, you know, I'm powerful because I'm a self objectifier, something mm-hmm. like that, what Carolyn Heldman calls self self objectifiers, and that they're getting some kind of power when really it is they're getting male attention, that yeah. their power is coming through men and not in and of their own right. And and so uh, Jennifer Posner wrote a book just a few years ago called Reality Bites Back about reality TV and the depiction of women mm-hmm. and how this is just, you know, taking women back 40, 50 years instead of, you know, on this trajectory toward a more progressive place. And you're right. I, I mean, many of those shows, by the way, she informed me because she went behind the scenes. She's in my new film and, and they'll film three hours to get 30 minutes of all of the the fighting and the rivalries and all that stuff that they think makes good television. But that narrative has been long that women should see other women as rivals and not as sisters. And And gossip. And gossip and all of these old-fashioned things. And but I said to my students recently in my gender classes, I think this kind of seven, this second wave feminism is making a huge comeback. I was at both of the women's marches here in L.A. And first of all, I'd never seen so many people in a march. And I've been to other marches. And they were different generations. They were different cultures. There were lots of men there as well. And I realized something's going on. This sort of sisterhood notion is coming back Mm -hmm. instead of the Kim Kardashian, I'm really hot version of feminism, right? Something's happening. Yeah. I think that there are enough women in the workforce and enough women in university that men who are in their 30s, 
20s, 30s, 40s, that they are wanting to participate in this because now it's no longer, women aren't aren't really other. Women are the ones that they're in study groups with yeah. or that they're working with, that yeah. they're partners with. And so, but there's, there's a real interest, like there's not really a desire for men, I would say like 20s, 30s, 40s to just uh, maybe even 50s, but to have women as other. And maybe that's what you're feeling when mm-hmm. you go to these women mm-hmm. marchers, that there's a difference mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. You're right. There are more authority. There's more female professors. So this notion of authority of uh, women is, is not weird to these men. They've been raised thinking that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you're right. They don't other women from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem, of course, is this sort of Freudian notion that men will put women in camps. Mm-hmm. Here's the women I re- respect, and then here's the ones I don't respect. Mm-hmm. And they'll, you know, there's still that problem, I think, even with educated men. Mm-hmm. If your power is defined by your looks then you'd better get as much as you can right now because by definition, our society is going to devalue you as you get older. And and that's not true for men. It's why men can still be action adventure stars in Hollywood in their 70s with a love interest in their 20s. So if we're going to continue this regressive model of that women's power comes through their looks, it was a very old fashioned view. This disempowers women ultimately. And It's probably not going to take with a lot of young women and the selfie feminist movement, whatever you want to call it, is very powerful right now. I just go back to Gloria Steinem and let them – I don't know what to say about that. When when my students bring that up, I'll say, what do you think? And I'll ask my female students, what Mm -hmm. do you think? Talk about it. You know, because I'd rather not – right? You know, I'd rather not say, well, you know, I think what's – right? Than a mansplaining to women how they should be women. I'd love to know what your uh, latest film project is. Two of them, like I said, the one, and I was just editing that right before our, our I came here, is on uh, bullying and youth suicide. And I have to be honest with you, it's it's um, this film is so dark and and so heavy. And I, it, from a very selfish perspective, I can't wait till it's over because it's uh-huh. really been difficult. Does this also hinge on more on men, or is this you know an even problem with girls, boys, and also maybe we should mention is this. Um, are we including race in this? Is this across yes. the board or is there something, there's nope, a difference? Okay. Very intersectional. I brought in scholars from different backgrounds and, and even media. I mean, it's bullying. You know, we've got a bully for the president and I bring him into this as well. That mm-hmm. How do they expect kids to turn around their lives in bullying when they see it from the president? That, that you get points for that, that people look up to you for doing this. So, mm-hmm. But, you know, 5,000 kids in America kill themselves every year, 400,000 attempt suicide. And it's devastating when you're a kid, you know, the things that you and I would go, what, what's the big deal is devastating to them. You know, their, their, oh, whole, their whole world, world is their yeah. friends and yeah. their cliques and all of that. And, and there are predators out there that try to get girls to, because there is a gendered component here, that try to get girls to flash the camera or something like that and try to blackmail them. That's a thing now as well. And then these pictures end up all over their their school. Friends are seeing this Mm -hmm. and they're devastated and they'll, you know, so stuff like that. So it is a gendered component. But that was that part I was telling you about earlier that I was started to interview those families and realizing I have to make this a standalone film to do justice to their stories. And the other film is sort of it. The title of the film is How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? which is that famous question by W.E.B. Du Bois Mm -hmm. in The Soul of Black Folks. You know, how does it feel to be a problem in a country where you are another, where you aren't treated as anything but other? Mm-hmm. And and but we make it intersectional. In fact, one of my my colleagues in that is from Loyola, not Loyola, Loyola, Loyola Marymount. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and Angelica Gutierrez. She's in the business econ department. And she's okay. my partner in this film. And and so we've looked at dreamers and and what they're going through. Oh great. And Black Lives Matter. Okay. And. And, of course, women and LGBT and all of this, how they're othered in a country that doesn't really value diversity. We say we do, but and we're slowly getting there, but we really don't. Okay. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's great work. Uh, let's see, how can people get in touch with you to learn more about your projects? You know, they can write to me. and You're on Facebook. The, I'm on Facebook, and the MEF uh, website has all my stuff, including contacts, agent stuff, and all that. Um, but they can just write to me directly. Yeah, go to Facebook, Tom Keith. You'll see. <laughs> you know, no, I'm happy to have uh, people, you know, write to me and chat. Sure. Yeah, he has a very active Facebook account. I know this. Mm. All right, thank you so much. Enjoyed it. 
Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave it a rating or a review. And if you'd like to become a patron of the show and support the content, you can go to patreon.com slash good is in the details. Bye.